Uh, it's, been, it's been such a warm welcome uh, coming to Vancouver. Uh, thank you, Leslie. Thank you, Cornelia, who took me around yesterday for uh, all morning seeing wonderful, wonderful masterworks um, and cook, making me breakfast. <laughs> I feel uh, very much at home here, and it's, uh, it's been a tremendously warm welcome. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I, I, I now know what my funeral will sound like, <laughs> which is, I guess, exciting to, to hear in advance. Um, this will be uh, a, a quick journey. I want to take you on a journey through a number of projects. I think that's the best way to illustrate uh, process and, uh, and the reason I like to get up every morning. Um, it's the work. And what I want to do is take you on a journey of two things, a journey of scale and a journey of storytelling. Um, growing up in the South, as Leslie mentioned, um, what we did in the evenings was sit on the front porch and talk and watch fireflies. And it was a pretty simple, a simple childhood, but it was dotted with many, many trips to big cities, cities all around the world. So it was an interesting balance of, of rural childhood, being responsible for chickens and horses, and then these wonderful immersive trips to New York City and, uh, and European capitals. Um, I uh, had, just to, to show the, the evil empire and its scale, um, we have a tiny office in San Francisco of two people, so it's not too evil. Um, we have uh, a 10-person uh, practice in New York City, and then uh, 25 people in the Charlottesville office where the firm was founded. Um, as Leslie mentioned, our, our book, Garden Park Community Farm, uh, came out with Princeton this summer. And despite the cumbersome title, uh, there was a, a method to that madness, which was was really to try to describe the breadth at which landscape architecture could be practiced and the way we're practicing it within, within our office. Um, our, our profession, sadly, is, is invisible to most people, um, to really, really smart people. <laughs> They've somehow still never heard of landscape architecture. I sat next to a gentleman on a plane um, flying from San Francisco to New York, and. Um, he, he looked at a book I had, and he was like, oh, Frederick Law Olmsted. Oh, he was that town planner. And I was like, oh, yeah, but so many other, other things. And I said, do you know Central Park? And he was like, yeah. And I said, well, he designed Central Park. And he really thought that was just the part of New York that didn't get built on. And I was like, you have a PhD. Are you kidding me? I said, don't tell anybody else this. <laughs> so. Um, I think stories are a way that we can reveal the dynamics of a landscape. We can talk about its layers of cultural history and the complex web of ecologies that inhabit, that inhabit the land. Um, stories are a way, of, a way of doing that. So each of the, I'm gonna run you through uh, five projects uh, in a very brief format and then one project at some, at some length um, to just reveal to you our process. Uh, at the seminar tomorrow, I'm going to talk about projects that are on the boards. These projects, with the exception of Hudson Yards, are all completed. And um, for those of you who've worked in offices, you know you never want to take a picture of your work until like five years later. So um, I thought it'd be fun to see some uh, process uh, projects tomorrow morning in the seminar format. And it'll be a very informal question answer format. We'll just sit around a table, I suppose, and, and, and chat. So the first project I wanted to uh, walk you through is a tiny project. Um, it's called Carnegie Hill House, and it's 25 feet by 32 feet. And in this uh, tiny uh, backyard of a townhouse in New York City, we set about uh, creating a story. When we met with the owners, they had three small children, and they said, you know, this house, it feels like a kind of retreat. It's, you, you move through the house and you come to this little surprise of a tiny backyard. And we want it to be the place that our children play and that we read stories and that we spend time together. Um, it's about four blocks from Central Park. And I called the director of ornithology at the University of Maryland and I asked him, what were the bird species that were struggling in Central Park? What were the bird species we could most expect to find nearby that we could help? And he gave me a list, and he gave me specifications for birdhouses and circle size, aperture size, and stick length, and all these sort of d details of bird anatomy. I was like, great, that's a interesting information. Let's let's sort of add that into the process. Um, we uh, we started to formulate a story about uh, nesting, about making a nest, and a place of nurture and a place of retreat. 
And so in this, uh, in this <laughs> tiny space, we started to envision it as a diptych painting. Uh, two parallel paintings, like a lot of uh, early paintings from the 15th century, where you have uh, two different scenes side by side. The ginkgo trees were brought forward right to the edge of the pavement, um, which rather than filling the space, creates a kind of scrim that you look through. The detailing of the woodwork, we began to weave pieces of the, the slats of wood or bevel to sort of evoke uh, weaving and a little place for uh, the children to go outside and, and, and draw and play. This is looking down on this giant basket that sort of furthers the analogy of a nest. And the, the uh, parents and the kids all can pile into this uh, giant chair and uh, feel immersed in this garden experience. Um, when you get to the roof, there's a wall of, of edible herbs on the bottom, of strawberries and uh, culinary herbs that then have this living wall that's a vertical garden up uh, six stories above the city. When you get to the roof of the building, there's a sky meadow, we call it, and it's more constructed planters, but with the native grasses of, uh, of the New York region. So again, supporting uh, uh, bird life uh, and also creating this immersive, um, immersive meadow that you sit down inside of uh, and you see the towers, you see the spires of the city, um, but you're somehow very simply, very quietly um, in this perch, this kind of lookout to the city. These are um, river birch um, and native grasses and perennials uh, underneath. And from the top, you can look back down and see this kind of diptych painting of this tiny, tiny garden. This, strangely, uh, won the ASLA Award of Honor uh, last year. Um, for such a minuscule postage stamp. But if, if I'm going to introduce the idea of scale, it was a good place to start uh, today. Um, this is a, a, a brownfield site, in a way. Um, Iron Mountain House is a, a farm project, a 300 acre farm project in South Kent, Connecticut. And the site that was chosen for the house was a f uh, had, had a significant amount of blasting, of dynamite blasting into the rock faces. For, since the 18th century, this mountain had been a quarry for iron ore uh, for making munitions. Uh, there are very rich seams of the orange pellets and that, that you can see as raw iron ore. So as a site of disturbance, um, we got very interested in successional meadows uh, surrounding the house. Most of it is grazed land for cattle. But we, uh, with the help of uh, a consultant, Larry Wiener, um, uh, reinvigorated this grassland. Um, in uh, the lower 48, uh, the most rapidly disappearing ecology is uh, the native grassland habitat. So when we have the opportunity to reestablish these very important uh, wildlife infrastructure uh, elements, we seek to do so. The house was designed by Graham Gund of uh, Gund Partnership. And you can see the, the prow that it sits on uh, was, was not envisioned early on. That was something we added because the house really had the feeling that it was falling off of the ledge that had been established by blasting. So we took the rock of the site and made these very large prow uh, walls that responded to the, to the site and started to mediate between the meadow and uh, the spaces just adjacent to the rooms of the house. The planting palette of native New York uh, perennials and grasses hopped the wall, and we, we played the game of using the this native straight species in the meadow and the cultivar of those, the more showier cultivars, so that you started to understand this difference between cultivated varieties and native varieties. We then used that palette of grasses almost in a, in a playful, uh, maybe uh, Gertrude Jekyll way of big drifting, as she would have done drifting perennial borders, uh, we're just drifting large borders of, of the native grasses. So taking that meadow, the wildness of that meadow, and bringing it into the site and sort of uh, refining it a little bit, but still making it, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty messy place. When you arrive to the drop-off, this uh, elliptical drop-off, you move th actually through the building to go to an interior courtyard. So there's no lawn on the outside of the house. There's, there's no, uh, 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 none of the typical suburban things. Uh, and it's, uh, it's a lush kind of immersive experience of horticulture. Um, once you go into the courtyard, the language goes very, very quiet. The walk to the courtyard is, um, is filled, again, with these uh, perennials and grasses. This was soon after planting, so it still has that um, early, days, early days hair transplant look. But um, that goes away pretty soon. Once you go into the courtyard, it's simply a, a rectangle of lawn. Um, 
Board form concrete walls create stitches between the exposed rock of the blasted site and the walls that we made of the native stone. So you have this kind of dynamic of excavation and intrusion and then careful stacking up and piling of the stones. There's a tension between the parent rock and the constructed walls that sort of hold these little rooms, outdoor rooms of the site. Um, it's operating at a variety of scales. The stone that it's carved out of is massive. Uh, the vista is tremendous across the 300 acres and a 40 acre lake. Um, the house is quite small and these garden rooms really mediate the space. We, because of the history of, of iron ore excavation, we used Corten steel a good deal in this project. It felt like it really feels like it's from the site. Um, and the walls going from this massive rock outcrop back to the, uh, to the uh, exterior retaining wall are all board form concrete. Um, one of the games of that fence is we, uh, in this region, there are uh, white birch and silver birch forests. And when you see them receding in the woods, you see these like white slots that recede through the dark forest. And so the fence was inspired by that vision and a kind of inversion of that, uh, those voids sort of being the flip, the figure ground of, um, of that forest vision. It also meets pool code. But we do have the pragmatic along with the, uh, the fun. So this is, uh, when we were hired for this project, the owner was uh, very interested in covering up all of, a lot of this rock because it, it, it felt like a scar. And once we got over the, the brutality of blasting and started talking about the power of parent rock and that you really, in this project, can truly reveal the geology of the site, um, we, started to, we wanted to celebrate. So we actually cleared off more soil to expose more of this, of this a beautiful colored stone, and then poured the board form concrete right into it. So pinning steel, uh, steel uh, rods into the stone and then pouring the board form concrete around it. And that's a granite basin that we designed and had carved uh, for washing vegetables. Um, that's a detail of the seam. We're really you know, scribing the formwork right to that rock. And so it reveals that tension between the, the intervention and the natural uh, uh, stone. We then curved Corten steel, a uh, very thick, uh, a half inch thick Corten steel into this uh, amphitheater of vegetables that in the snow makes this graphic, very simple design when, there's, when there are no plantings. So it goes from a minimalist abstract landscape in snow to a very exuberant and almost Baroque uh, vegetable garden. <laughs> if it ain't Baroque, don't fix it, is my motto. Um, and then the idea, I don't know if any of you have ever trespassed in quarries, but I've done a lot of swimming and diving in quarries um, that have been abandoned. And you have this, this idea, this sort of block of water that's carved into the rock. So this is the swimming pool overlooking the house, the arrival oval. And you can start to get a sense of the scale and sweep of the landscape beyond. From the pool, you look right down into this absolute simplicity of rock, concrete, grass, and steel. The next project I wanted to talk about is one that will illustrate um, uh, something I call taking values and making values physical. I suppose all of our design work should be that, but this one is a particular case, which is a, a, a winery and tasting room in Sonoma, California, uh, owned by two best friends, uh, Medlock and Ames. And uh, these are some of the photographs of the ranch. They have a 300 and, I believe it's 380 acre ranch and they're committed to only cultivating 25% of it in grapes. All the rest of it is a large scale restoration ecology project, um, rebuilding, uh, managing invasive exotic plants and rebuilding the distinctive Sonoma ecologies that are present on this land. It's organic and biodynamic following Rudolf Steiner's teachings. Um, uh, livestock is used to graze between the grapes. Um, they have owls to manage rodents, um, huge owl boxes all over. And you can feel the health of this place uh, when you're in it. This is their market garden. It's a large uh, terraced vegetable garden. Uh, they uh, harvest and sell uh, produce, fresh produce, as well as uh, preserved uh, produce. And we've been working at the, at the winery for a little while. And they said, hey, we want to talk to you about something we've done. We've bought a gas station. <laughs> I was like, why do you have a gas station? And they said, well, and it's surrounded by asphalt uh, all the way around. They said, well, we want to do a tasting room. And your assignment is to take 
our values that you know well of our land stewardship, how we make wine, how we grow food, and tell that story to the public through landscape architecture. Wow, that's a cool commission. Thanks. So off we went. Um, and we began uh, doing uh, renovation drawings for the, for the building. We did the conceptual design. I have 10 architects on staff uh, in our practice. We did, uh, then turned it over to a local architect who did all the permitting, the construction documents, and construction supervision. Um, uh, and he did a terrific, terrific job. I'm sorry this is a bit faded, but the, the lower left bar is the roof of the gas station. And we, of course, took up all the asphalt. Um, and uh, started to look at ways in an arid climate we could really talk about water and water uh, retention. So stormwater management and conveyance became the framework for uh, the little tasting room. Uh, I don't know if, if you know in California, uh, the, the way olives are being cultivated is changing pretty dramatically in the past few years, where they grow olives on trellises. Uh, plant small olive trees, grow them on a trellis, and trucks can pass beneath to do the picking. So old, old olive trees are now considered uh, passe or low yield or difficult to manage. And so you can buy an olive grove for almost nothing. So <laughs> we wanted to uh, bring large scale trees into the, into the project and we were able to, to take an olive grove that was on the chopping block, I suppose, and bring it to the site. So we want to tell the story of resource management, um, the productive landscape through vegetables and, and olives, and also the making of, of good public space to tell their story. So we made a porch, um, a very minimalist uh, porch with a steel frame uh, uh, awning and then uh, troughs that carry the roof rainwater down chains that then go into uh, crushed stone. And there's a very big cistern system that is all the irrigation water uh, for the vegetables. Uh, this is the vegetable area. Um, uh, the herbs and uh, small vegetables are used for, for pairings, uh, for tasting the wine, and then there's a pizza oven for um, cooking outside. You can see the olive trees here that were, this was the, uh, within a few months of them being moved to the site, they moved very, very well and immediately gave scale and presence and, and shade. Uh, to this former asphalt parking lot. So a little bit like Iron Mountain House, it's kind of a brownfield site um, uh, turned into something very, very new. What you're seeing in the foreground is actually the, the stormwater retention facility. It's the, the treatment basin, the infiltration beds. Uh, so the Juncus effusius is the conveyance swale that's bringing the stormwater to this central feature, and that's right at the base of the tasting porch. So uh, the public is made very aware of of these values. In the distance, you can see the board form concrete uh, fire pit that we designed, and then the furniture uh, that we also did for, for tasting outdoors and dining. You can see the, the beautiful hills of Sonoma in the distance, uh, grapes in the middle ground, and then this productive landscape in the foreground. On the, uh, these guys are younger than I am, who own the, who own the winery, and so they have a, a great attitude about their employees and they, they're really friends with the people they work with and so they built a whole ropes course out of telephone poles up at the winery for them to kind of play on after work and we love that idea and so we, we were sort of inspired by the ropes course to take cedar trees and basically sharpen them like pencils or masts of a ship and we designed these steel cuffs that carry them and then hung wires back and forth so you could have lights or banners or you could really uh, change it around for events. So it's a place you can dress up or dress down. Um, and then we sighted the trees so that they really uh, fingered through these cedar posts. Um, the table we designed uh, inspired by uh, Villa Lante, <laughs> which <laughs> if any, any landscape architectural historians in the room are going to shoot me. But um, in the uh, 16th century, Cardinal Gambariah commissioned a massive marble table and a little creek of cold water went through this glorious Baroque stone table. He's spinning over in his sarcophagus right now hearing me because this is our hillbilly version of uh, repurposed uh, wood siding from a shed on the site and a galvanized steel trough down the middle of, to fill with ice so we can have white wine tastings uh, to uh, bring a little bit of joy. Uh, this is the table at night with the lights and cables strung. Um, friends enjoying pizza from the oven. And there you can see a close-up of the, of the steel trough um, 
and the ice uh, keeping the wine, the wine cool. Um, this uh, next project is uh, very much on the boards. Uh, we, we won this, this project uh, about a year and a half ago. And uh, it's the Hudson Yards uh, development of the west side of Manhattan. It's the largest single development project in the history of New York City. Um, so <laughs> we're scared to death. Um, when we interviewed, we interviewed against uh, Sasaki and Olin. It was an invited uh, interview situation where three firms were each paid to work for a month. We were all given the same base information, and we dove in. So we went about our process, our typical process. We called experts. We brought in Jill Jones, who is um, uh, the author of Conquering Gotham, a fantastic, if there can be a cliffhanger about building tunnels and railroads, this is it. Um, Conquering Gotham is the name of her book. We brought her to New York City. She spent the day with us telling us about um, uh, the unbelievable history of rail uh, in the city. The Hudson Yards is, is this site. So, so Jill was really uh, uh, a key to, to starting to understand the dynamics and the periods of construction of rails. You can see uh, two, three acre block, well, no, it's more than that, it's uh, 26 acres all told. So there are two halves, the eastern yards oddly are to the left, and the western yards are to the right, and that's the Hudson River in the distance. Uh, just to the top of the slide is the High Line. So the High Line comes up, curves, and dead ends into our site, uh, not dead ends, it connects to our site, and then arcs all the way around and comes down to the ground. So that big sinuous line is uh, field operations uh, uh, High Line project. Um, that's the entire site. You can see the, the High Line continuing looping around the site. Our current construction has broken ground last November on the northern, the, um, the upper uh, quadrant of this project. Um, so back to the process. We had Jill Jones come. We had Eli Gottlieb, who's an expert in structural engineering of, of, of slabs, uh, putting landscapes on slabs over, over um, voids. Um, all these trains have to keep running. So we're building 9,000 foot skyscrapers will be built over this 26 acre void. Um, that's an engineering feat. And it was really strange. I thought, you know, our, our work, we, you all, me, us, um, is, is between art and science and horticulture and culture and all these things that we never quite know the right answer. You could always just keep designing. You could keep diagramming. You could make it better. And I was talking to Eli uh, about you know, these, these thousand foot skyscrapers just barely resting on just a few columns that get slid down between the tracks. I was like, Eli, how do you sleep at night? And he just looked at me really puzzled. And he said, well, the numbers tell me it works. And I was like, oh my god, you blessed soul. I can't imagine ever having a design where you knew it was good enough. You know? So he rests easy, we don't. Um, uh, the, the next expert we brought in was uh, Brie Sarté of Sherwood Design Engineering in San Francisco uh, to talk about sustainable uh, strategies for stormwater management in an urban site. Uh, Stephen Handel then joined us. He's the Chair of Programs and Biodiversity at Rutgers University uh, to talk about microecologies and urban environments and what would be the opportunities for, uh, for creating more uh, microecologies. Um, we then consulted the Manhattan Project that uh, had this wonderful map from uh, the imagined Manhattan from 1609. And we added those red squares. That's the eastern yards and western yards of Hudson Yards. So you can see where the edge of Manhattan actually was uh, in the 1600s. These are the maps uh, showing the train tracks at Hudson Yards over time. This was an incredible moment in the history of New York in 1908. The Suez Canal had been built, the Transcontinental Railroad had been built, and then there is this amazing moment where a tunnel is finally built beneath the Hudson River that connects New York City to, the, to basically to San Francisco for the first time ever. Up to that point, the Transcontinental Railroad would bring 40 million people a year to the eastern shore of New Jersey, and they would have to get on steamboats to get over into the city. No one had done it because the geology beneath the river in section looked something like this. The granite cliffs of the Hudson continue straight beneath the river. Uh, and so the rock is about 400 feet down. That crevice is filled with glacial silt. 
and that silt actually pumps. So there's nothing to attach a tunnel to. So it was uh, Cassatt, I think mean, Henry Cassatt, uh, the brother of Mary Cassatt, the, the wonderful painter, who was an engineer and the president of the Pennsylvania Railroad Corporation at the time. And he used the technology of sus suspension bridge, basically, where you anchor one end of the tunnel at each end into the granite. And then in 30-inch caissons, they're hot rivet welded together, massive caissons, to form a tube that essentially is hanging through the silt uh, beneath the river. So it was uh, touted as one of the greatest civil engineering feats the world had ever seen, uh, comparable to the Suez Canal and the Transcontinental Railroad. This is the plan, uh, the section and plan of the crossing of the river. And you can see to the right uh, where it says uh, Manhattan Shaft. Two towers were built, one in New Jersey, one in Manhattan, and they would recite every day. The engineers would tell, calibrate this great head shield, that's this gizmo in the middle, that advances 30 inches a day. And all those scoops remove the soil. So you would open those up and people would pull all the silt and, and stuff behind them, and then weld this tube of the tunnel. By the way, this is the tunnel that you still take in and out. It's a, it's a little creepy. Once, but after we did this research, I was like, I think I'm going to definitely drive out of the city. Um, this was a, a, a sort of revelatory moment in our research uh, where Jill Jones had suggested that we contact the Hagley Museum of Industry. And so trying to find images of the site. And in this amazing picture, you see the groundbreaking for digging the shaftway to build the tunnel. It was the first day of drilling to begin this project. They had bought a building, torn down the building, gone into the basement, and that's where they started to drill. In the lower right-hand corner, we noticed that this said uh, West 32nd and 11th Avenue. We realized, wait, that's in the middle of the Western Yards. This, is, this huge moment in history occurred on our site. The place is called Hudson Yards. It's owned by one developer building these massive skyscrapers. You know, where is our story of this place? Um, and we felt like we'd really hit on something. So from the Manahata project, we'd learned there were five rivers that converged under the site. Uh, we learned this was the Shaftway uh, from 1904 and the, um, the route for the Pennsylvania Railroad Tunnel. We, every tree is built into a pit that's hanging over the active train. I mean, there's no soil. So this is a synthetic, it's a kind of a cyber landscape. It's, an, it's a parallel universe to the real land that we typically work with. So within that, how do we reveal that process? How do we talk about the way that this platform has been constructed and built? Um, we also were asked by, by the owner to do something very much in tension with and distinct from the High Line. So we thought to use the horticulture of the High Line, to use the native plants of, of New York State, but to use um, uh, management, maintenance, uh, aggressive management, to create a very abstract uh, contemporary landscape. So this idea of one tremendous figure, this massive ellipse as the public plaza at the heart of the, of the towers, these large blocks are all the thousand foot skyscrapers. That a geometry big enough to hold them all together, but that could then offer in the corners and edges, uh, retreats and different scales, like, like what was done at, city, at uh, city Garden. In the center there is our idea for a monument that would mark this spot that was the point where uh, the drilling began. These are um, uh, precedents of the, just to prove that people like to go up a few stories and look out and see the world. Um, uh, this wonderful one, the arm of the Statue of Liberty that got delivered to Madison Square and stood there for a while while I figured out where to put the, put the statue. Um, so we uh, conceptualized in our competition um, a double helix stair that would be an ADA ramp uh, slope. So you could go all the way up to the top of the tower and then all the way back down. But it would be over the shaftway, over this, this very historic point. And it would be a fun thing to do. It would be a beautiful object. And if you wanted to know a little more, you could learn uh, what its role had been in stitching New York City to the rest of the United States. Uh, so this was uh, one of our competition renderings, just really simply showing this form uh, and a very active uh, public plaza. We also wanted the horticulture to be impactful. So we did a rendering showing it in fall. Uh, we would use uh, sweet gums pollarded and sheared into this massive uh, elliptical form. 
Um, and then the idea that you could project onto the, the walls of the building. Uh, Hussein Bolt had just uh, had that wonderful projection uh, across Parliament, and we're sort of inspired by that at this time. So this project, uh, uh, one of the skyscrapers broke ground in November. Um, we are now going into uh, schematic design on the plaza. It's all changing the monument, the idea of the monument. They loved that, and they said, stop. Now we're going to get a world famous artist to do it. And we're like, oh, dang, we could do that. Like, come on, guys, let us, let us, you know, come on, let us try. And um, they said, nope, 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 you hang on. So they have just uh, secured um, a great artist to do this. So we're very excited about the collaboration, and, and away we go. So this will be on the boards until 2017, and that's just the Eastern Yard. So this is a very, very long term, uh, long term project. But I thought it was probably good to see a, a, a range of scales and a range of typologies from so urban that there's not even earth <laughs> um, to uh, rural farmland. The last project I wanted to talk about, um, yeah, we're okay, we're okay right? Time-wise? Yeah. Okay. Um, the last project I wanted to talk about is Young Nick's Head Station. And for me, this is uh, a kind of culmination of the mission of the firm. If I think NBW's mission, I could say it in a sentence, would be to take, uh, to aspire to design excellence in service to restoration ecology, cultural landscapes, and rich public space. Um, in this case, it is a 3,000 acre working farm on the east coast of New Zealand, on the North Island. Um, a client of ours purchased this land, and they said, you know, it's the most beautiful place you've ever seen. We want you to come over. Uh, there might be a few little things you want to do, but there's not much work here, but we'd love for you to come hang out. And I'd already done a project for them in New York and one in Virginia. And so doing our typical research, we started to understand that the farming practices in New Zealand left a lot to be desired. Um, the site uh, is kid, where it says uh, Young Nick's H. That is the site uh, to the right, that little sort of appendix that sticks up. Um, we've also done a project at Cape Kidnappers for a different client. Um, when, I'm going to show you this slide first. When, we, uh, when I showed up, I was like, gosh, I'm afraid you've bought an ecological disaster. Like, this is supposed to be temperate rainforest. That's the natural ecology of this place. Um, the farming practices are, you know, it's, the, it's, it's the, the fundamental economy of the nation, so I completely respect that, but it's, it's gotten a little bit out of control in that if you have wetlands and you want to have more grazing land to make more income, you can just drain all the wetlands. It's, they're not protected. Um, if you want to deforest uh, the rainforest uh, species, temperate rainforest, um, you can do so. So this property would have been an incredibly rich ecology, and it's reduced to fescue. Um, <clears throat> when we uh, began this project, it was 12 years ago now, um, and it's become one of the largest restoration ecology projects in New Zealand. Um, and we've had some really exciting successes that I'd just like to walk you through. Um, on the left side, it's three images, three outlines of the same property. The one on the left is, we call it the cultural landscape of the Natamanehiri. Um, these are the, the, um, the Maori people. Uh, the Natamanehiri is the tribe that lives near this property. Uh, these are all sites of uh, burial sites, uh, food storage sites, community sites uh, that had been across the property, all, uh, uh, many of which were uh, very, very sacred uh, to the Maori people. The Natamanehiri uh, landed here in 1300 with the Great Migration. Um, in massive canoes that they came from Southeast Asia. And so this is their founding piece of land. Um, they lost ownership of it with the um, Treaty of Waitangi. And so it then was held by one family for 100 years, and our American client acquired it 12 years ago. Oh, the, the part on the right shows the scale of our interventions that have been mostly rebuilding these broken ecologies uh, from aggressive farming over time. The other important, important historic piece of this property is that it also is the piece of land that Captain James Cook first sighted when he discovered New Zealand in 1769. So for both Western migration and Eastern migration, this is the first landing point. Um, that gives it a little extra 
um, extra importance. And so when we uh, first started meeting with the client about what to do, we, th we thought about what if this becomes a model farm for sustainable agriculture for New Zealand, using uh, the native rainforest trees to re, uh, reforest the steep and eroding slopes, the coastal property that's actually terrible grazing land. You know, we don't want to take away the, the best property, the best land for grazing, as long as it's stable and not contributing to soil loss or, or any kind of pollutants into the, into the ecosystem. And so by that way, uh, we one made friends with the farmer who um, was managing the property by, by in, you know, not taking away uh, his opportunity for profitability, but also taking these, these fragile edges and turning them into, uh, into working landscapes for the local flora and fauna. Um, this is what the native New Zealand rainforest looks like. Um, this was my first trip there, and the scale of the plants is stunning. Um, this is a, a, a vintage image of building the railroads through New Zealand, through these massive forests. And so you just would cut the trees, make the, tra make the sleepers out of them, and run the rails right into the forest, and send the trees to, New to Australia. Uh, much of much of old 19th century Australia was built from New Zealand forests. This is what gets left behind after the, um, the Pinus radiata cultivation today. And as you know, with rainforest soils, these are volcanic uh, clay soils, highly erodible. So when you clear cut like this, you can, in aerials, you can just see plumes of white uh, sediment going into the oceans. This is the property with the white cliffs. They're very famous. It's in every textbook about the history of New Zealand, the landing site, or the first sighting site of Captain James Cook. So this is a plan of the 3,000 acres. And the bright green patches um, and dark green patches are all the reforestation land. We've so far planted 600,000 uh, native rainforest trees on the property that we've eco-sourced. Um, uh, from the region. We also worked with the Natamanahiri tribe locally to build a greenhouse and made a commitment to buy 6,000 trees a year from them. It's now they're selling trees to other people within the region who are doing similar uh, reconstruction of, of, of uh, reforestation projects. So it's led to a, a very small but sustainable uh, micro enterprise uh, in the region. Uh, these are the, the size of the little trees that, that we plant. Um, in, in this series of slides, I'm going to pull back so you can start to get a sense of the scale. The, the white rod is just a fiberglass stake, so you can go back and find the tree for weeding and, and pruning and caring for them in the first couple of years. Um, the way the sheep uh, naturally move through this landscape and its high erodibility lead to this crazy, it looks like a topographic model, right? This layering that you're seeing in the distance. That turned out to be fantastic for this project because we could plant the restoration trees on that little flat area that the sheep would tread on, and it would hold a little bit of the rainwater. Um, you can't irrigate 600,000 trees. Well, I guess somebody could, but we, we weren't going to irrigate 600,000 trees. So keep your eye on that uh, cabbage tree in the middle. And as I pull back, you can start to sense the scale of the intervention of the reforestation, where the entire headland is going to become one connected forest for terrestrial migration of birds. Um, this shows the linked terrestrial habitat, and then both of these promontories, which were key uh, orientation uh, landscapes for migratory birds, uh, we have reforested and protected. The one at the top has a predator-proof enclosure. Um, that's the, the area that is, uh, is protected. You can see the plumes of erosion that come off of the land. Um, the other fact uh, this, that stunned me when we started to look into the, into, um, into the New Zealand ecology is that there are no native mammals. Well, there are two species of bat, but you know. <laughs> there are no terrestrial native mammals in New Zealand. So what that means, it's the largest land mass in the world to have no mammals. So there are no cats, rats, stoats, people, uh, dogs, cattle, nothing. No mammals. And so when you start to think about that, it really creates a unique ecology. Birds diversified to fill all the different niches that uh, large mammals have filled on every other continent, uh, land mass in, on the planet. Um, so we had a 12-foot tall bird called the moa that was like a giant uh, emu, sort of an ostrich-like 
fella. Um, we found the fossilized remains of one on the property that's now uh, gone to the National Museum. So when uh, the Maori came and then when uh, James Cook landed and subsequent English settlement happened, they brought mammals with them, brought rabbits to eat, and then the rabbits did what rabbits do best. And they needed to bring stoats and weasels to try to kill the rabbits. And of course, the stoats and weasels went after these big fat birds that no longer flew because they had evolved away from flight because they had no predators. And you have, uh, you have uh, a devastating impact on extinct species that had evolved uniquely to this, the endemics of this island only, only occurred here. So tremendous losses to global biodiversity. This is the enemy. Um, I know, don't, no, do not go all. That's not cute. Um, well, it's kind of cute, but. Uh, so we um, uh, installed a predator-proof fence. Working with the Department of Conservation, we set a very, very high bar for this project. Could this working farm, demonstrating best management practices for sustainable agriculture, interwoven with best management practices for wildlife restoration, um, achieve the Holy Grail. Could we reintroduce the tuatara to mainland New Zealand? The tuatara is the most, uh, one of the most endangered uh, animals on the planet. Um, it's a reptile. Um, it's actually a sphenodont. It's the last living descendant of the dinosaurs. It's about a three foot long, looks sort of like an iguana. And the tuatara is uh, extinct, or nearly extinct, mostly because it lives in a symbiotic relationship with a bird, the gray-faced petrel or the sooty petrel. The petrels lay their eggs by digging a burrow. They put their body down in a hole, lay their egg, and that's how they incubate. When they hatch, they fly away for three years. The tuatara only gets randy when it sees one of these holes, and it gets you know, the urge to party and lays an egg, and that's how little baby tuataras come around. So with mammals eating and killing off the small birds, uh, the offspring, and the eggs in particular, the sooty petrels and gray-faced petrels were starting to decline in numbers. The tuatara uh, absolutely are you know, easy prey for uh, something like a cat. Um, so uh, we had to prove to the Department of Conservation that we had 10 years of successful uh, pest management. So we uh, used this product. It's called an excluder fence. It's uh, stainless steel mesh that goes underground and forward one meter so that animals that come to the fence that burrow down can't get under. And I always think it's such a great life lesson. Like you're struggling, you're struggling, you're struggling. If you would just back up and go down, they could do it. But nobody does. <laughs> None of these burrowing animals uh, have made it in. And we're doing ongoing monitoring inside, inside the enclosure. At the top is a large hood that should rats climb up the outside. They can't get over that hood. They drop back down. Um, these are the brave souls installing the fence. You can see where it curves and comes forward. Uh, and then the soil is put back and replanted. Um, this is its pretty dramatic terminus, so animals aren't crawling underneath that. The entire interior of the fenced area has been reforested. Um, this was it just after installation. We call it our Eco Cristo. Um, uh, admittedly, we were inspired. <laughs> we were inspired by high art. Um, let's not forget these things have to be. These places have to be beautiful and functioning and powerful. And I think large scale works works of art. Um, these are some of the amazing folks who come and monitor uh, and do all the paperwork for the Department of Conservation. This is our guy. The guy on the right is, is a, a tuatara, and that is a gray petrel. So the petrel's down in its burrow, incubating its egg. The tuatara is asking when it's going to move. <laughs> this is one of the most heartwarming things that's ever uh, uh, happened to me. These birds had not um, been on this site for 100 years. And this is uh, 6.30 in the evening as the sun is setting, the number of these migratory birds that are now populating the site. We have fluttering shearwaters, gannets, uh, and petrels. This is successful thanks to the genius of our teammate, uh, Steve Sawyer, who is an ornithologist and conservation biologist. And there's no electricity out on this promontory. So he made a recording of bird calls. Um, 
of these species we wanted to attract. And every evening around cocktail time, the uh, solar panel kicks on the recording, outdoor speakers project these calls of the birds. If you ever want to gaslight someone and drive them crazy, I can give you the CD. <laughs> You've never heard anything like the shrieks and screams of these birds. But it's working, and they are coming in in droves. Um, another reason that they're such easy prey is that they have no fear. When they land, they just land on you, and they flop around, they kind of peck at you and check you out. And um, Very, very friendly. He's not you know, holding it, it's just sitting on him. And that's Jim Kovac from our Virginia office. Um, the next piece of the project, oh, the, the punchline is that two and a half months ago, uh, the Department of Conservation, after 12 years of work, released 65 tuatara on this property into our predator-proof enclosure, and it's a tremendously successful reintroduction. So we're very, very excited about that piece of news. Um, the next piece of the project was to deal with the damaged wetlands. 65 acres of natural wetland had been drained by massive trenches into the Pacific Ocean to maximize grazing land. Um, we, we realized we were going to rebuild an ecology and we did not want it to look natural. We didn't want it to look like nothing ever happened. Just like at Iron Mountain House where there had been blasting of the rock, we celebrated that rock. We celebrated that scar, the memory of the disrupted ecology. We wanted to do the same thing here. So we started to look at the, 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 the slopes and gradients we needed to have on the islands, the amount of water that we would have uh, given the annual rainfall, and then started to develop the grading plans of the different islands so that they could become the proper habitat for the broadest range of native birds. <clears throat> here again, we were inspired by Roberto Burley Marx um, in these landforms and the resulting wetland looks like this. Um, the, the wetlands in the foreground are pre-treatment pre ponds. Uh, to the left is a saltwater marsh, and then to the right are the islands and uh, the freshwater marsh. In summer, the, the water, and you know, times of drought in summer, the water drops, and it makes one very graphic, sinuous line. Each stage of rainfall, you have a different painting that emerges as the grading um, is slowly subsumed underwater. So this is the high tide mark. And now you can start to see different projects working together. Reforestation of the coastal line, the uh, freshwater and saltwater marshes. We also rearranged the agriculture. Um, this is a citrus cultivation. Uh, we wanted to do a reforestation project along the banks of the river, but use this big scale geometry to make evident the cultivated landscape versus the wilder landscape. Uh, this is the result. Uh, these, these hedges are vast, long hedges. Uh, they're shelter belts, and it's required in this part of New Zealand um, to knock off that degree or two that could freeze the blossoms of the, of the citrus trees. Um, we also designed the 150-foot free-span steel bridge that connects the two pieces of the farm, so uh, trucks and, and uh, equipment can get across the bridge. So, the area between the hedge and the river is reforested, and now it's starting to grow up. This, this is a photograph that's a couple of years old. The foreground paddocks have not been planted in citrus. The ones in the distance have. Um, we grew corn in there waiting for the shelter belt trees to get big enough that they could do their job. Um, this is the bridge. We sited the bridge and the service road for uh, the citrus production on this very sacred hill. Um, it's called Mount Taranaki, and it's uh, uh, one of the really iconic landscapes of the property to the Maori people. Uh, we invite the uh, Maori elders to come for any celebration, any introduction of new animals or plants to the site. It's called a pofari, and we host that ceremony. That's uh, me with uh, Temple and um, Olive and a regrettable era with a ponytail. <coughs> um, <laughs> Um, this is uh, the, the citrus production from the air. Um, and then the, the last little bit in, in closing, there are two pieces of this that I wanted to address the cultural landscape. When, when we first started working in New Zealand, uh, local farmers said, you know, you, you can't trust the native people. They're just, you just, just don't even bother. And I was like, what do you do the next day but go meet them? You know, I was like, Okay, um, let's go find out. And they have been the most welcoming, warm, nurturing people and have been a tremendous partner in this project. 
I've learned so much uh, from the Natamanihiri elders. Um, and we have been careful and enthused to show them every project that we plan to do on the, on the property. And, and they've really been uh, tremendous partners throughout this. After a few years, after about seven years of working with them, um, I, was, I got summoned to their morai, where um, they said we've been, and I thought I was in trouble. I thought I'd done something terribly wrong. And um, they said, we have been um, in prayer, and we have come to the determination that we would like to ask your firm to design an expansion to our 500-year-old cemetery, which was a major, uh, uh, an incredible moment. Um, and you know, I said, I'm not, uh, I'm not Natamurihiri, I'm not Maori. And they said, that's OK. It doesn't matter what color you are. You care about land, and that's what we care about, and that's what we see inside. And I was like, wow, this is, this is where racism finally dies. And you look inside to the heart of another person, and you realize that you share common ground. So <clears throat> very simple project, but the, um, the land mass uh, in the center of the fan uh, was uh, the original cemetery, the historic cemetery. We added the part to the mound to the right and then a grassy parking area to the left and generated this large arc of sentinel trees. They're called um, kahikatiya, and they, they can get 140 feet tall. And the idea was that these sentinels would someday surround the cemetery almost as guardians uh, around the outside. The left part is another citrus production. So we reoriented the road to actually look down an alley. The shelter belts are incredible. I mean, they're actually agricultural use, but we're like, we'll use them in service to ceremony. So you arrive at the far left, and you can either carry the body or drive the body to the cemetery. And using the shelter belts to create this alley, and at the end of it is the historic mound that was the original burial site. Um, these were sketches uh, to look at the, the different parts of this proposal. And then this was uh, the reorientation of the road. And you can see the shelter belts going in. And you can see the old mound there in the center with some sarcophagi at the top. And then this is an aerial of the completed project. And you can see they're protected from, uh, from cold. But the kahikatiyas are now installed. It's almost like a, 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 an art installation, these green uh, tubes running around the large arc. And you can see the parking in the foreground, the shelter belts growing up for the citrus. And so it's this. Agrarian landscape, highly abstract, very contemporary, in service to this historic and cultural landscape, and everybody's winning. And it's just felt like a really wonderful, um, wonderful chance that landscape architecture can be this kind of mediator between all these different factors. Um, this was uh, one of the ceremonies uh, for dedicating a site. And then the last piece was taking these, these cultural lessons and putting them through our, our lens as an artist and, uh, and as designers and bringing them home to, this, uh, to, the, to the homestead, which was where the family lives. Um, it's a complex, it's a historic house that we've made additions to. And it's a series of gardens all the way around the house, each with its own story. But there's only one I really wanted to talk about tonight. And it's the earthworks garden at the top. And, um, the Maori have an amazing tradition of shaping earth and moving earth. And I thought to end with this for design students might be the right, the right message um, as we make and, and shape the world that we live in for other people. Um, the, the culture was almost disappearing. The language wasn't taught in schools anymore. And this is really changing. Just over the, the 15 years, I guess, I've been work, doing projects in New Zealand. Um, things have really, really started to change. Um, there are now Maori schools, Maori language schools, uh, traditional dance, uh, uh, craft. Things are really on a resurgence. And it's an exciting moment, I think, for Maori culture in New Zealand. Um, this is on the property. This is a kumra pit. They, these large, perfectly circular depressions or bowls where they would store food. Um, in this slide on the left, you can see a very distinctly terraced mountain that was constructed uh, by the warriors as defensive battlement sites or pa sites. So there's this amazing terracing and bowls and uh, language. And 
So we working with them and talking to them about how could we make something that would evoke the power of this earth forming, but not be a quotation. You know, we're not saying like, oh, your culture is cool. We want to do a little of that. It was really, um, how can we make a meditative and very simple garden um, inspired by these things? So this was the resulting uh, earthworks garden that is planted all the way around by Hebe, just one plant all the way around, and then an arc of cowrie trees um, that are planted uh, in the middle. Um, this is the meditation, the mound garden, looking out to the distance, and right through the trees is one of these terraced hills, so there's a kind of, almost like in, in uh, traditional Japanese gardens, the idea of a borrowed scenery of capturing, capturing a greater landscape and bringing it internal to the garden. So this slide kind of summarizes, I think, a lot of what I, what I wanted to say. Um, we've, we've crossed scales from a tiny backyard to a vast uh, property um, this, in the southern hemisphere. Um, we're also looking at a natural landscape in the distance, but a natural landscape that's been highly manipulated through deforestation, through farming. Um, tremendous amounts of e effort and energy are going into restoring some of those networks. In the middle ground, you see this uh, using horticulture and husbandry uh, in agriculture, the shelter belts are those long parallel lines of citrus. And then this, this very contemporary, abstract, and simple moment to meditate and think about the layers of all that's come before as you think about where you're going. So thank you so much for having me here tonight. <laughs>